For USCFootball.com, I'm Keely Orr here with Shotgun Spratling for instant analysis of USC's 42-28 loss to Stanford in the Coliseum. Now, Shotgun, this was a USC team that came in as a 17-point favorite and a Stanford team coming off a loss to Kansas State where they only scored seven points. How do you begin to make sense of this game? Unacceptable. I mean, it's one word. This was an unacceptable game for USC for uh, a program with this storied history that they have. This was unacceptable. You know, if you watched any of that Stanford game last week, they looked absolutely hapless. It looked like they couldn't get out of their own way at times, and USC made them look like world beaters in this game. You know, they scored 42 points in this game after scoring seven last week, 35 on offense because USC gave up a pick six in this game as well. Um, you know, and this game wasn't even that close. It wasn't even 42 to, I mean, 42 28. It was 42 13. They were down by 29 points in a game where they were favored by 17 points coming in. Uh, this is one of the worst losses that I, I can remember in USC history uh, just because of the point spread. They barely covered the reverse point spread by scoring two late touchdowns to, to get it uh, down to a 14-point game. But it's just unacceptable. This is not the, the USC program of uh, your older brother or your dad or your granddad. This is a USC program that's really struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Now we got to talk to offensive coordinator Graham Harrell and quarterback Keen Slovis after the game, and both of them agreed that there were no surprises from Stanford's defense. The word that kept coming up was execution. They just needed to execute better. Graham Harrell even went as far to say that they need some more effort on certain plays. But, Chuck, why is execution a word that conti we continue to hear after USC's losses under Clay Helton? I mean, this is an execution-based offense, so, you know, if the offense isn't – if you're not executing, then the offense is going to be rolling, and they're not rolling right now. They're not in sync. Um, you know, they've been able to move the ball some, but they really struggle in the red zone. Keaton Slovis is not on the same page with his receivers outside of Drake London. And talk with Gary Bryant today. He was back in the lineup, but there were probably four or five plays that went off the fingertips of players that could have been touchdowns. Those are in the red zone only. Um, so, you know, if you get a couple of those instead of kicking field goals, that changes a little bit of the momentum there and gives you a little bit uh, better points going into the into the halftime. It would have been a little bit different there. It would have been a one-score game instead of two-score. You know, just a lot of small things that aren't aren't working right now and like uh, looking at the offensive line I didn't think they played terrible but they didn't dominate and that's what this the offensive line needs to be doing they need to be able to dominate and if they're struggling to to get on the same page right now with Keaton and the receivers with an air raid offense that wants to be pass happy and then you know, if you have to rely on the run, then you got to do that, and you got to be able to run the ball. And this Stanford team is not a team. They Kansas State ran all over them last week, and yet USC they ran the ball okay today, but they weren't able to dominate. They weren't able to put away some of those blocks to be able to break a big run. That was one of the things I talked with one of the offensive linemen said. You know, we ran the ball okay, but we couldn't bur you couldn't get any big bursts uh, to kind of open things up. And that's the thing with this offense: all these small details that aren't being you know taken care of. Yeah. And that's kind of the whole thing with the entire program right now. There's small details that don't get taken care of. The attention to detail is just not there. It's not the same level that you would find at a national championship caliber program like you would expect USC to be. Mm -hmm. And it definitely adds up over time. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's what you're seeing is that it wasn't one thing in this game where you point out and, like, oh, they had one big play. They didn't. No, it was multiple explosive plays over and over. It was the offense not being able to finish in the red zone again and something that's you know that they've struggled with. Not being able to score touchdowns in the third quarter. For whatever reason, coming out of halftime, yeah. the adjustments opponents are making, USC is taking too long to adjust to the adjustments they're seeing. Um, and going back to 2019, they really struggled. I mean, in 2020, they really struggled with that last year. They have not scored a touchdown in the third quarter yet this season either. So it, it's small details, but it's all across the board. Mm -hmm. This was the second consecutive game where USC's defense did not record a sack. Now, the difference between both games was that USC was able to make uh, Nick Starkle uncomfortable against it when playing San Jose State, yet Tanner McKee looked like he had a lot of time, and that put pressure on USC's corners. Yeah, I mean, USC had a similar game plan. They were going to stack the box. They were going to shut down the run and try to get pressure on the quarterback. Well, last week they were able to get pressure even though they weren't able to get the sacks or the tackles for loss. Nick Starkle did a really good job of getting rid of the ball quickly. Now that – uh, equated to some inaccurate passes, and you know USC was able to get a big pick six they were able to take to the house. Tanner McKee had all day back there. He yeah. had plenty of time, and this is the difference between a six-year quarterback and, hey, he knows he's got to get rid of the ball. Well, if you could get the same type of pressure they had last week on a, a guy making his first career start, yeah. 
then you should be able to create not only some inaccuracies, but possibly some turnovers. And they were not able to get back there. So Tanner McKee was able to get in the rhythm. He was able to stand back there. Didn't ask him to do too much, but he was able to throw up those jump balls to the wide receiver, something Stanford has been known for year over year over year. So yeah. USC knew it was coming. And a position group that has been really good, you know, coming into the season, had really a lot of confidence in that cornerback group in particular, but the defensive backs as a whole. And today, you know, they got worked. You know, the Stanford won pretty much every one-on-one -on -one matchup. And now that wasn't just the DBs and wide receivers. That was across the board. Yeah. Every one-on-one -on -one matchup, it mm -hmm. just seemed like Stanford wanted it more, and Stanford went out there and made the plays where USC didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems like we're in a similar position covering this game, Shotgun. It's an early loss where USC technically controls their destiny. It's a North team, so they can still win out in the South and reach the Pac-12 championship. But at what point is it just Groundhog Day for USC and its fans? I mean, yeah, you can reach your goal of the Pac-12 championship, but after this loss, is there any confidence that this team will go undefeated and make it to the Pac-12 championship? And then maybe you would have a chance at the college football playoff with a one loss, and but that would come down to the eye test. And USC hadn't won the eye test in a while. Uh, so, you know, counting on that doesn't seem like a, a very fruitful bet for USC fans. So you look at it and you go, okay, well, if our goal is a Pac-12 championship, yeah, we could probably still accomplish that. But is your goal to be a national championship caliber program, which USC should be as a blue blood, as a, you know, a, a team with, with the national championships that they have, the Heisman Trophy winners, the All-Americans, all those type things? No, they, they should be fighting for national championships, not fighting for a Pac-12 championship. That should be something where it should be, you know, 80% like USC is going to be in the Pac-12 championship every single year. And that's not been the case recently. It's like, how can they find a way to get in rather than, yeah. you know, will one game, you know, will something crazy happen to keep them out? Um, so, you know, if USC, if the, if the program's goals are to be a Pac-12 championship team, yeah, they can still accomplish that. If their goals are to be in the CFP and to potentially win a national championship, it's very hard to, to picture this team that we saw tonight turn things around and go on a run and do that. Mm -hmm. In that sense is what we saw tonight, a fireable offense for Clay Hilton. I mean, I did tweet that, that watching this game and looking at the point spread being a 17-point favorite, a team that, like I said, was hapless, that looked basically – they looked like trash last week, Kansas, Stanford. Stanford against Kansas State. Um, so to turn them into world beaters, a, a team that puts up 42 points on the board, yeah, I mean, this is uh, – this is not what is supposed to look like at USC. It's not. And, you know, if USC wants to be the program that they've long time been, then, you know, it, you can't have performances like that. Mm -hmm. There's not really much more to break down of this game, Shotgun. You kind of summed it up right with that, that last sentence. Any final thoughts before we wrap it up? I do want to say there were a couple positives in this game. Um, you know, I, I do want to say the atmosphere was great here pregame. Uh, the, they blacked out, turned all the lights out before the team ran out. Thought that looked was really cool. The fans really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, the fans were going crazy before. The student section came early. They were great. They stayed the entire time. Got to give credit to the student section for staying. You know, they were chanting fire Helton and stuff, and some of the players on the sideline were not happy about it. Um, but I do give them credit for staying the entire time. When it's a Saturday night, they could be going out and, and doing some other things. Uh, but they stuck it out even in a game that was 42-13 to 13 in yeah. that fourth quarter. Yeah. So give credit to them. Also a couple players that stood out, Alex Stadhouse, you know, Parker Lewis had – Probably the biggest hit that USC had the entire night, their kicker on the opening kickoff, and he gets ejected for targeting. Uh, that's not a good thing when your kicker has the, be the the biggest hit of the night. But he gets ejected. Alex Stadhouse, walk-on, who had done some kickoff duties for USC in the past prior to Parker Lewis coming uh, arriving at school, someone goes, dude, I think you might have to go in. And he's like, wait, what? Yeah, you're going to go in because there's a targeting call. And he stepped up and made a couple field goals and was really good on the kickoffs and stuff as well. So give credit to him for, for stepping in when you know he probably was not expecting to play tonight. Darwin Barlow got his first opportunity. He had a touchdown late in, in the game. So good to see you know uh, transfer getting in and you know making an impact there. But overall, it was there's not a lot of things on the defensive side you look at and like that was really good. It, no, there what there wasn't um, on the offensive side. The offensive line was okay, but what they need to be better. The quarterback and receiver connection needs to be better. Yeah. Um, I did like that there was more rotation at the receivers. Kyle Ford comes in late, uh, gets some opportunities, kind of in garbage time, and makes the most of it. Had three or four catches there. Uh, Taj Washington, Katie Nixon, all those guys had some some opportunities and made some catches. Joseph Manjack had his first catch. So I like the more the more opportunities for different guys, yeah. but. 
they've got to figure out a way to get those guys in sync with, with Keaton Slovis so that those throws in the back of the end zone to Gary Bryan Jr. and to Drake London are touchdowns instead of turning into field goals. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, that's going to wrap it up here from the Coliseum for Shotgun Spratling. I'm Keely Orr. For more, check out uscfootball.com.